good afternoon. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm not sure why you're clapping. You don't know what I, I'm going to present yet. So, so if you say, no, if I'll see the same thing after I finish, I'll take it as a good job done. So, uh, you know, I'll talk about how we actually make major releases uh, because I had an honor to actually see three of them being done, rel 5, rel 6, rel 7. And I watched Rail 8, but I cannot talk about that yet. And uh, I was thinking that actually uh, there is a very good story to, te to uh, tell about Rail 6 and Rail 7 major releases. Because there is a lot of lessons learned we took from that. But before I start, I explain how we actually make those things. So uh, this is this slide you probably saw, seen already like thousands of times, but this basically uh, explains how we get from upstream projects through Fedora into RHEL. And you know, it may seem as a simple thing, but there's actually a lot of important stuff that's happening in this transition. Because those two, Fedora and RHEL, they are distributions, and distributions main goals it is to integrate all the all packages together right and you know when you work at scale of operating system this is not about one or two pieces of software this is literally thousands and thousands of packages you need to put together in a way that actually works together and it you know brings value to users and customers and uh, so when you look at this just like remember it, because you know, I was thinking that you know, it's, it's actually good to look at how we made RHEL 6. So this is schedule, I intentionally didn't put too many dates, because I can't, right? I mean, those are internal information from Red Hat. But we started somewhere in 2008, at the beginning, and then finished in 2010. So that's, you know, four years of work. The other piece is, when you look, you know, we did three alphas and we did two betas. And you know, here you can see the linkage between the RHEL 8, oh, sorry, RHEL 6 alpha and Fedora. And you know, this was just a refresh. There's actually one thing that's being hidden in this picture, and that's a very, very good story. No, you can see there's Fedora 12 Alpha actually used for Alpha 2 and Alpha 3. And uh, this actually shows the importance of having Fedora as a upstream for L. Because this actually reflects a problem we had back in 2009 when we couldn't get uh, PowerPC and mainframe S396 architectures compiled internally in-house. And the reason for that was that those two architectures were lagging by two to three months in Fedora already. So what actually has happened over there was you know, we could get x86-64 done, no problem. You know, that was all up to date. But those two special architectures that like, not everybody has a PowerPC 9 under their desk, right? Uh, so those were lagging, and there was a significant amount of work that we actually had to do internally to get, get that done, to get that compile, you know, compiled, to get it actually booting and running. So that's one piece. The other piece is, when you look at these, these are points where we actually did something we call mass import. What that means is, you know, we have internal source repositories where we actually store all the source code for RHEL. And at that point, we just wipe those out. We take all the code from Fedora, I mean, selected packages, and import them, import them internally. And it's another uh, point where the Fedora plays an important role because we did that wipe out four times, right, internally. So that means that even Fedora, on source code level, contains references to RHEL. If you see in any 
spec files. Those are basically description how to build a piece of software. There's a lot of references to RHEL in Fedora. And this is the reason, because we do use Fedora as something that actually uh, is a, a development ground for RHEL. So this is RHEL 6.0 story. RHEL 7.0. Now we did three alphas, one beta. Started 2011, ended 2014. And I still remember the date, June 10th, uh, because of, uh, you know, this was my Reese. This is where I was working on for four years. And uh, you can actually already see a couple of lessons learned there. Can I go back? You know, we used Fedora 11 final, Alpha, Fedora 12 final. This release was a little bit out of sync with what was happening in Fedora. Fedora 7.0, on the other hand, was perfectly in sync because we were just using the final Fedora bits to import them in-house. So we just went through Fedora 16, 17, 18, and 19 as clockwork, just doing them, because this is the way how Fedora brought the best value for Red Hat, because most of the work happened upstream. From real point of view, that means Fedora, and we put everything together. So this is the story of how we actually take all those packages that are somewhere out there, run them through Fedora, where they get integrated, where we do all the major development changes, and then bring them in-house and build an operating system from it. Uh, going through this, uh, there was a lot of lessons I learned. I mean, working on, on you know, for four years on something, that actually learns you a lot, through pay, mostly, right? So uh, I was thinking, what are the lessons to share? And one lesson I learned very hard, in a hard way, is the documentation is key. And uh, I'm not talking about user documentation. I'm actually talking about two kinds of documentations. One is uh, documentation for teams. Imagine four years long project with hundreds of engineers on it. Those teams will change over time. People will come and leave, right? You know, they do something now and then they don't have to touch it for next three months, they forget. So having a consistent good documentation where people can actually go to, figure out how to do certain things make a, makes a lot of sense. The other piece is documentation that leaves a bread country. And what I mean by that? Uh, when my colleague uh, was running RHEL 6.0, she left a lot of project-related documentation behind her. You know, meeting minutes, phase exits, retrospectives, like tons of stuff. And when I started with 7.0, all of that was like a chest of gold, I found. Because there, was, there were things that you know, went wrong, there were things that went right, there was a lot of stuff to learn and uh, you know, use for 7.0 development. So even if this is not for you, you know, my colleague Sly, she didn't need it for, for me. Like, you know, she just created all the documentation as, she's, as she went, and I did the same on 7.0. But you know, it's basically for future generation, right? On a future team that will work on something that, that long in the next couple of years. So that's one thing that was really, really hard for me to, uh, to realize. And you know, it's not easy. Right? The other thing is rinse and repeat. What I mean by that? When you recall 7.0 schedule, you know, we did alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and beta. And uh, although it, you know, it's a four years long project, we actually found a way how to make sure that uh, you know, we repeat certain parts of the project to make sure that you know, we can actually run a retrospective on that piece. You know, we did alpha one, run a retrospective on, on alpha one. It was so hard to do it. You know, we improved the process a little bit, run alpha two, run retro retrospective on it, 
improve the process a little bit. When we were doing alpha free as a program manager, I even didn't notice it happened. Because team already knew what to do. They were running like, like a clockwork. So this is one example. The other example is, you know, when we do something we call snapshot, that means like, you know, on a weekly basis, we curate all the ISO images and everything and test them. And that was, that's another rinse and repeat approach. You know, today it's called DevOps, Agile. Back then, you know, it was waterfall and we were doing snapshots. So like terminology changed, but the benefits of doing something repeatedly as quickly as possible and uh, in a way that it doesn't change over time as quickly. So for people, you know, for people it's almost a routine. That there's a lot of value in it. But you know, when you do retrospectives, uh, there's one important thing, you know, asking team uh, what they liked, what they didn't, and it doesn't matter if you're running waterfall, if you're running agile, you know, there's the, in scrums, there's a piece of it that I've forgotten the name, it actually says, like, you know, the team gets together and reviews what has happened. One important thing is act on actions. It doesn't make too much sense if you ask people what they think if you don't do anything about it. The next thing uh, I was uh, dealing with in, uh, myself pretty hard is cone of uncertainty. If you are project manager, program manager, I know you're a scrum master, uh, and you have something very long ahead of you, don't try to make perfect plans. Because, and I like that uh, analogy a lot, plans don't survive contact with the enemy, right? What I mean by that, uh, if you have a three years long project, plan maybe six months ahead. Have an like, overall plan, but don't try to like, nail every single action for the next three years. It will change, right? It will change so hard that you know, you'll spend tons and tons of time redoing what you already planned and throwing it away, you know, being upset. So on Rail 7.0, when we were running the team, uh, what we did was basically, uh, we had a quarterly meet, uh, planning meetings where we planned for the next six months. And like, you know, updated schedule, updated, you know, processes as we needed, etc. So th that actually at that time gave us enough room to work with all the teams across, across the company. The other piece is uh, that product is work of many teams. And uh, what I mean by that is, Yes, engineering is important. Development and QE do a lot of work. But once those two teams have bits ready to ship, there's a lot of other stuff that needs to be ready to ship at the same time. You need to have support ready. You need to have marketing ready. You need to have sales organization ready so they know how to approach the customer. You know, sometimes some kind of certifications user documentation, there's like a lot, you know, uh, a lot of things that needs to happen. And even if you develop something in agile fashion, there's always a point in time when all those teams need to know what are you going to ship. Because there are, you know, some of them, like my, my uh, favorite example is actually marketing. Marketing is not able to deliver on two weeks sprints. They need to have something to build their message on and then communicate it, uh, it to the rest of the world. And uh, this is the last piece I actually uh, learned. And uh, I cannot stress this out strongly enough. Because if you work on something that's four years long, you do need to find uh, destruction. Just small project on site here and there you know, make fun, do something different, because, you know, it can get at you really, really quickly. The other piece is, uh, you know, in today's world we hear a lot about work-life balance. It's not a buzzword. You know, when, when my colleague was doing uh, Rail 6, do you remember the Alpha Free story? And, you know, we had to, like, you know, do something special in-house. She had a vacation planned. For two weeks she wanted to go to Peru. And uh, she was really hard thinking, 
should I stay at work and finish this really important piece to, of work, or should I go somewhere else, you know, spend my time with, with my husband and take a rest? And she decided to do the later. She gave me all the work. I was freaking out at that moment. But I mean, it was so important for her to recharge so she, you know, she could actually carry on in next, you know, for the next couple of months. So uh, that's where I would like to finish. I left 10 minutes for questions. Uh, who wants to start? Uh, excuse me. Biggest, biggest challenge for the team. Big. I mean, it's it's hard to say there was one biggest challenge because, like every like the project goes through multiple phases, right? At the time, you know, we we did a little bit of planning, etc. But in case of Rail, the biggest issue is the size of the project. And what I mean by that, you know, if you have a team that's hundreds and hundreds of engineers big, there's a serious communication issues, because you know it's so hard to hit every single people, uh, person in the organization. It's uh, so that's one piece. The other is that uh, at that time communication between development and QE wasn't the best. It actually refers to the previous talk, uh, because QE was. Like seriously lagging behind development, and stuff was literally thrown over the wall to them, and developers didn't care much. Okay. Sure. Is it possible to say something more in terms of how you start to structure the documentation from the way you start? So, uh, mm -hmm. and do. So this question is about this is, is it, if I have a more details how we structure the documentation. So uh, if I talk about project documentation and you know, meeting minutes, stuff like that, uh, for that we actually have a place where to store those. So like, for me there was like you know, a place where I could find all the meeting minutes, like every, you know, every single week that you know, what has happened on 6.0 and you know, I did the same for 7.0. For the phase exits, stuff like that, you know, we had a folder where we had all those documents where I could access them. So, and at the time, it was as easy as using SVN and track, where we stored PDFs. So it was like, you know, really simple. Uh, on the other hand, it didn't break over years and years, right? I mean, something that was created in 2009, I was able to find it even in 2013, which, uh, like, you know, the simpler solution, the better. In this case, sure. Yeah, same angle, because like I mean, that's common with documentation. But it's so overwhelming, you can't, you don't know where to start looking. So you were able to find these important things. That's right, because so, hard so you know the question is about that. You know we were able to to find those important things, and you know this is because of at that time like our manager forced us to create a structure of documents. We didn't like it. Now, it's, it's better to create something than throw it away when you don't need it. But he really was pushing us to make sure we put it in one common place, even as PDFs, so you know, they couldn't be edited later on. But you know, it was still, as I said, like you no know, chest of gold when I needed it. Any other question? Sure. So what do we do before the final uh, final federal release? So uh, we basically do development in two places. One is in upstream because you know eventually when the package gets updated in upstream, it gets into federal, right? So that's a source code, and the other piece of development is going directly in federal because you know what 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 usually happens when we import stuff into RHEL is we change compile flags, you know, we change configuration of kernel, stuff like that. But, you know, usually, you know, we take, you know, 
base oh, sorry, source code from Fedora 1, 1 to 1. We just restrict the number of packages we import just to those we need. Because Fedora has like no much higher number of packages than what we actually ship as uh, in rel. Yes. And it's really like a Fedora is our development distro. That's why I you know it gets broken from time to time. And uh, you no, know, they are actually independent project of RHEL. So you know, we, when we were doing RHEL 7.0, we approached them. I mean, we approached FESCO, Fedora uh, Engineering Steering Committee, and actually very kindly asked them to make sure they keep hitting the dates because it was so important internally to Red Hat that we could actually work with those. And they were so glad they almost did that. <laughs> I mean, it's a software project, right? OK, uh, I think we have maybe room for one more, if there's any. Sure. So uh, can I imagine that you know, we'll just keep cranking out major releases like, as a continuous deliverable? Yeah. Did I get that right? Uh, there's one thing that stays in the way, and it's called uh, actually two things. It's a, a life cycle, because RHEL has a 10 years uh, of support. And during that life cycle, we promise to not to break kernel ABI, and at some places, even the user space ABI. And it would be so difficult to keep up to date with all that happens in the upstream while not breaking those things. And like, like I get that like not everybody uh, understands why the old stuff is important. But uh, like Tokyo, Stock Exchange, for example, runs RHEL. And they just cannot the operate, change the operating system every year or something like that. You know? For them, it's important to deploy it and run it for years. And that's actually one of the values, value proposition of Red Hat, right? Or RHEL, why they pay us. Otherwise, they could use Fedora, they could use something different. Okay. One more, I have like two minutes. I don't see any hands, so thanks a lot. Cool.